Hello. <laughs> First of all, let me say I have um, friends of mine who are friends of Judy's, and she will, I will try to let it get back to her that she is definitively not a fire hazard, so <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. <clears throat> It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you again, as it always is for us. This feels uh, like home for us and is home for us, so it's just a joy to be here. So I want you to consider what we're, the story we're going to talk about today of Abigail uh, Nabal and David as sort of a two-part season finale. <laughs> if this were a TV show, it would be somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe a Law and Order or to uh, hit it directly on the nose. There was an NBC show several years ago called Kings, a modern retelling of the story of David. I loved it, which meant it lasted about 12 episodes, but there you go. <laughs> so let's meet our characters. We have three that we're going to really spend some time with, as I said. Uh, the first being Abigail. She is beautiful, strong, and courageous on the inside and the outside. And you'll see that as we journey with her in our text. The next being her husband, uh, Nabal. I keep wanting to call him Nabal because I'm from Lubbock, Texas. And <laughs> I just want to draw that first syllable out for some reason. I don't know why. But Nabal is about as polar opposite to Abigail as you could get. He is mean, surly, foolish, which is a key word, and wicked. And this is not foolishness like ha-ha, comic foolishness. This is true obstinacy and wickedness. Well, and in like true fairy tale language, his name itself means fool, right? Yes. I mean, that's, that's one of those, like, every time we read this, we're like, oh, it's kind of like, it's such an on-the-nose story. <laughs> so <laughs> his mother did not like him very much whenever <laughs> she named him. <laughs> she knew she was creating a signpost wherever he went. <laughs> the last character we're going to spend some time with is a character that if you've been in church at all or even alive, um, we probably know something of, and that's David. David is just, David is courageous, David is hot-headed, hot-blooded. If this were a Disney movie, Hercules has been going around in my brain as we wrote the sermon and the muses that are in that movie would follow David around with his hero music every time he came on the scene. So just know that David is our archetypal hero. And, you know, once we have the characters in place, this is kind of like a previously on again. The text tells us that David has been protecting Nabal's sheep out in the wilderness. He and his army are kind of hanging out. He's been on the run from Saul. And he and his army, which is about 600 men, I think, um, they're just kind of going around and doing their thing. And one of the things they've been doing is protecting these shepherds that are out in the wilderness. And if you can imagine, if you're a shepherd out in the wilderness, there are all kinds of dangers to your sheep and to yourself. So having 600 men kind of around is really helpful, right? So 
David hears that it's sheep shearing time. And sheep shearing time is like harvest time. It is, we're going to get everyone together. We're going to get all hands on deck to get these sheep sheared so it doesn't take us absolutely forever. And in the midst of it, we're just going to have a party because all of us don't get to be together all of the time. So food and drink are expected to be flowing through the household anytime it's sheep shearing season. So David is not just kind of showing up on a random Tuesday. He's sending his men to request food and drink kind of as their part of taking part of the festival Mm because they're part of who made sure the sheep were still there to be sheared. Um, and, and he shows up, and he, uh, he sends his men, and, he's, and they, they're very nice and kind of polite for the day, and they say, we've been doing this thing. Would you please send us some provisions? Not only that, but our text is really clear that Nabal is rich. This is not like a low-level sheep herding operation. This is a very rich household and estate. So... By the conventions of that time, whether David had done him a service or not, Nabal would have been expected to offer hospitality because Nabal had enough to share. On the other hand. On the other hand, um, Nabal doesn't care. (laughs) Nabal has no respect for conventions. He's foolish. He has no sense of obligation to take care of anyone in need. And this says a lot about foolishness in this text. This is, as Justin said, this is not comic. This is not like a bumbling lack of awareness, kind of bouncing through life. It's intentional meanness. And if David did know what Nabal's reputation was, what's really interesting about this is not only is Nabal a fool because he doesn't respect the hospitality conventions of his day, but he's also a fool because he refuses to repay a good deed done. Right? He refuses to be reciprocal in care, which probably also says a lot about Nabal's care for his own people, that he doesn't care for strangers who protect his people well. (coughs) Up to this point, we've kind of, as Justin said, we've got like our little chorus, right, of, ooh, David. And David has been really noble. He's taken the high road. He gave a service without necessarily expecting a re- recompense. He certainly didn't receive recompense when he did the service. And he's respectfully asked for Nabal's assistance. But met with Nabal's evil and cruelty, David demands vengeance. Nabal is a churl, yes. He's like mean and wicked in everything that he does. He's easy to dislike. We could probably get kind of on board, right, with, okay, this guy was mean. We're going to be mean back. That's what this guy deserves. And while David may have been right to be offended by Nabal's dismissive and disrespectful refusal, we hear in the servant's report to Abigail We're now, in a way, fighting a war on two fronts, Mm -hmm. right? We don't just have the foolishness of of Nabal over here. We have the violence of David over here. And in the middle, we have an innocent household. In David's response, we witness the violence of choosing what the self believes it's due over the sacred dignity of the human life of others. And we face similar showdowns today. Mean-spirited ignorance and violent eradication of the humanity of others permeate our communities. In the Julian way, we have a front row seat to this in the disability community. We face it in hospital rooms where we're told that a diagnosis determines a life of health or a life of illness because people can't imagine that you would have health as a, as a disabled person. We face it in, when the mere presence of a wheelchair blurs the boundaries between helpfulness and non-consensual assistance. We face it when disability is a problem to fix and the rubric of success is normalcy. We also face it 
When stairs, curbs, parking spots, restroom doors, blank stairs, turn backs, trite words, and dismissive gestures tell someone, you're not welcome here. And we face it when misinformation is used to pass laws that restrict disabled people's access to voting. To have a voice in choosing the leaders who pass laws regarding the way their bodies can exist in the world. So, in the Julian way, I have a uh, young woman I will call Laura. Laura is 22 years old. Laura is fantastically talented in this space of YouTube uh, commentary and creator, and she does video essays that are incisive, witty, cutting, colorful, and creative. Laura is working with a vocational rehab coach to try to help her find her way back into the workforce after a traumatic experience several years ago has made that even more difficult than their condition otherwise would. <laughs> and instead of being helpful and understanding the gifts and graces that Laura has in the YouTube creator space, the job coach has at various times, several job coaches in fact have called her lazy, have called her unmotivated, have told her she has to smell a certain way, dress a certain way, uh, have posture a certain way, and completely done violence to the person and the human that this woman wants to be and presents themselves as in the world. So the violence and ignorance show up even in those state-based help systems that are designed to help those with disabilities find their way through and into society. Yeah. In the face-off between foolishness and violence, nobody wins. And the innocent always get caught in the crossfire. And here enters the hero, right? Well, we'll see. Here enters Abigail. Starting in 1 Samuel 25, verse 18. Then Abigail hurried and took 200 loaves, two skins of wine, five sheep ready dressed, five measures of parched grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs. She loaded them on donkey, donkeys and said to her young men, go on ahead of me, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. <laughs> As she rode on the donkey and came down under cover of the mountain, David and his men came down toward her and she met them. Now David had said, surely it was in vain that I protected all this fellow has in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him. But he has returned me evil for good. God do so to David and more also if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted from the donkey and fell before David on her face, bowing to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, Upon me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. My Lord, do not take seriously this ill-natured fellow, Nabal, <laughs> for as his name is so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, since the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from taking vengeance with your own hand, 
Now let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be like Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord and evil shall not be found in you so long as you live. If anyone should rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living under the care of the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. When the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for having saved himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you to meet me today. Blessed be your good sense, and blessed be you who kept me today from blood guilt and from avenging myself by my own hand. For as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me truly by morning, there would not have been left to Nabal so much as one male." Then David received from her hand what she had brought him. He said to her, go up to your house in peace. See, I have heeded your voice and I have granted your petition. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Boy, I love Abigail. (laughs) Every time I read that story, I'm like, man, Because not only did she have the wisdom to look at what her husband was doing and going, no, 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 no. This will never do. She had the wisdom to look at David, a man who was already in his ascendancy with literal military might at his back and go, okay, wow, killing everybody, a little bit of an overreach. (laughs) Maybe we need to give this some thought. And she not only said, no, no, don't do this, but she said, let me remind you who you are and what is at stake. She said, You are a great man, and if you act in peace right now and restrain yourself, your house, which is already in its ascendancy, will only get grander and be more set. But if you do what you're planning to do, the blood guilt, which for those of you who may not know, because I wasn't too sure before we read this, Blood guilt basically meant if you kill somebody in a way that is outside of the the Jewish covenant or law, that guilt follows you and potentially your family for generations and generations. And in the case of royalty, that's even extended out. So it not only follows you and your direct descendants, but covers your whole house. And the nation, right? And the nation, yes. So Abigail said, this could cost you everything. It's my fault. So what she did is got her physical body and safety in between her churlish, mean idiot husband and her (laughs) overly aggressive, overly testosterone, uh, you know, hero in David and said, I I guess I need to figure this out for myself. But here's the thing. 
by doing that, as I said, she reminded David who he was, and David listened. Yeah. And it's amazing, because when you think about it, when you think about what blood guilt would place upon David and his rule, she was doing her best to ensure peace for everybody. She got in the middle of foolishness and violence because not doing so meant a possible lack of peace and flourishing for everybody in that nation, mm -hmm. right? I mean, she's the hero. Yes. She's the hero here. But also, Justin, don't you think, is, is David really a villain? No, I think what makes David, if, if not heroic, but an example to be followed, is David was totally on one course, perhaps had the, uh, the lens of justice in the story. I mean, if I'm reading this story and I'm watching this show, <laughs> Nabal is someone who's up and so I want to come. <laughs> so, who could blame David? Right. But David took what Abigail told him and learned and said, oh yeah, I'm better than this. Yeah. So I'm going to be better than this. I mean, in so many ways, David is us. If we, if, you know, we can't really put him in the villain category and we can't really put him in the hero category either, but he is very much us in this story. David is noble and flawed, rash in his responses, but also curious enough to stop and listen. He had to want to be better to stop his plans for vengeance. And in many ways, we are all people who want to be better. The problem is that in our world, flourishing for all seems harder than giving in to violence and foolishness, particularly when we do not recognize the impacts of violence and foolishness in our own lives on a day-to-day -day basis. For the people we work with in the Julian way, foolishness and violence, or maybe more specifically, intentional ignorance and dehumanization, are at the core of their interactions with social programs, as Justin's mentioned, that are meant to help treat, help them, I should say it that way, social programs meant to help them, that instead treat them as case numbers and diagnoses. The restrictions placed on their lives just so they can have what they need to live severely limits the possibilities that they might thrive. We, as the church, then are called to enter the gap, to find foolishness and violence and push at them so that space can be created for peace and flourishing. And I think that's something that we have found in our work on anti-ableism in the Julian way as a beginning point, yeah. right, for pushing at these forces. I hear children in the back of the sanctuary, <laughs> so we'll move quickly through this. But in our work with churches and other community institutions on anti-ableism, we try to move from a stance that sees persons with disabilities as case numbers and diagnoses to a space of seeing them as people with gifts, graces, wisdom to give, and things to share. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think to that end, anti-ableism points us to the fact that flourishing is not just for like some kind of them out there, mm -hmm. right? If, and I'm so glad you brought that up, because one of the things we say when we talk to churches about making a church space accessible is if it helps those with disabilities, it helps everybody. Mm -hmm. So as we work towards flourishing for those with disabilities, we open the doors and the gates to flourishing for all of God's community. Right. 
With one in four adults in the U.S. living with a disability today, if you don't identify as disabled, you probably know somebody who does. Accessibility and flourishing, resisting ableism and embracing the whole of human experience is about flourishing for all of us. And you never know what gifts you're going to encounter when you start looking for them, right? In the ball, there's a foolishness grounded in the refusal to look past himself, which manifests as wickedness. And in David, for all his flaws, there exists the possibility and the willingness to explore something different, a different way of prioritizing the self in relation to others. And so I think as great as Abigail is, and she's certainly the hero in this story, it's interesting to stop and think that David had to say yes. How striking is it that Abigail took a chance that David, who only brought 400 of his soldiers for this vengeance quest, um, that Abigail took David with his 400 soldiers and gave him the chance to turn around and do something different, knowing that Nabal would never let go of his foolishness. So there's a dual invitation here. There's an invitation to be Abigail to recognize when people are systematically dehumanized, marginalized, and oppressed, and act. To put our bodies and our resources between the foolishness and violence of the world and the dignity of our shared humanity created in the image of God and demand peace. But there's also an invitation to be David, to be someone who values integrity, curiosity, and humility enough that when we are participating in foolishness and violence, we can be stopped in our tracks to be someone who is willing to listen when someone names their suffering and their hardships. And if you are someone today who doesn't identify with David and who doesn't identify with Abigail, but identifies as this household that feels under threat, This is also an invitation to tell you that your dignity, your personhood, and your livelihood are worth protecting. So keep speaking the truth, and we will pray that Abigail's will show up to listen. Amen.